Located in the heart of the community, the Brooklyn Schoolyard is one of the finest schoolyard developments in all of Canada. However, the Brooklyn Schoolyard development did not occur overnight. In fact, it took over four years of hard work on the part of the residents of the community to bring this playground about. My name is Harry Finnegan, and I worked as a community planner with the Brooklyn's residents for over four and a half years. I would like to tell you the story behind this schoolyard development. The neighborhood of Brooklyn's is less than a square mile in size. It is located in the northwestern part of the city of Winnipeg, about a 15 minute drive from the city's downtown area. Brooklyn's is surrounded by four busy streets and a fair amount of industrial and commercial development. As such, it has evolved as a fairly isolated residential area with its own distinct character and identity. The first houses were built in Brooklyn's at the turn of the century. People were attracted to it by the promise of low taxes, lack of development control, and the right to keep farm animals. For years, the Brooklyn's area, with its largely Anglo-Saxon population, boasted some of the most successful soccer teams in all of Manitoba, such as the senior team of 1916. The community underwent considerable change during the 1920s, with many Eastern European immigrants settling in the district. Many of the early Brooklyn's residents managed to find jobs in the nearby CPR rail yards and shops of Weston. Like so many communities, the school in Brooklyn's played an important role in the lives of the people in the area. The main school, which was built in 1911 out of red brick, was generally referred to as the Red School. On its 50th anniversary, it was officially named after Stephen Krawchuk, who had been its principal from 1933 to 1943, and who later became the area's MLA. In 1937, Krawchuk's school became the site of a momentous meeting for the then village of Brooklyn's. Members of the Brooklyn's Ratepayers Association packed the school hall, where after a somewhat heated debate, they endorsed the idea of introducing a sewer and water system into the area. Unfortunately, due to the high costs involved, it took some 20 years and many more heated debates for the idea to become a reality. Brooklyn's heyday seemed to occur in 1961, when with a population of just under 4,400 and the school bulging at the seams with over 1,100 students, it officially became a town. It continued to run its own affairs and to operate its own municipal services, including a volunteer fire department, right up until 1967, when it amalgamated with the city of St. James. Brooklyn's and St. James later became part of the city of Winnipeg through the provincial government's controversial Unicity legislation of 1971. Brooklyn's experienced a steady decline in its population from 1961 through to 1976, when it stood at approximately 3,000 people. In many ways, it found itself lagging behind the rest of the city of Winnipeg. It had few finished streets, numerous open ditches, and an abundance of poor quality housing, some of which had remained vacant for many years. It also offered few recreational opportunities. In order to help stem this declining population trend and to provide much needed support services to the community, the City of Winnipeg initiated the establishment of a Neighborhood Improvement Program, or NIP, in Brooklyn's. NIP, a federal, provincial, and municipally funded program, was established in the early 1970s to help in revitalizing neighborhoods such as Brooklyn's. The Brooklyn's NIP budget, with $4.9 million, was to be spent over a five-year period. In 1977, the City of Winnipeg established a community planning office here in Butterworth School, which is centrally located in the neighborhood right across the street from the older Krawchuk School. NIP staff were hired to introduce the program to the community, to encourage citizen participation, and to work with the Brooklyn's residents to ensure that the monies were spent on projects which the community wanted. By the spring of 1978, the Brooklyn's NIP Resident Committee was established. This committee consisted of 21 people who had been elected at meetings throughout the neighborhood. The committee quickly identified the Brooklyn Schoolyard as one site with a lot of potential for the community. Centrally located in the community, a short block away from the community center, 
adjacent to the library and the proposed site of a new indoor swimming pool, the schoolyard covered an area of approximately seven acres. It was described by some residents as nothing more than a barren wasteland. Krawcheck School, located on the northern part of the yard, housed the nursery school together with the kindergarten to grade four school program. To the south was located Butterworth School with grades five to nine together with the Brooklyn's daycare center. The two schools had a total enrollment of about 400 students. Early in 1979, NIP staff initiated a series of meetings with various groups and individuals which had a particular interest in the schoolyard. Meetings were held with the parent council and school staff, including the principals and teachers as well as the custodians. Students in each class in the two schools were also consulted as to the changes they would like to see made to their schoolyard. In order to provide everyone in the neighborhood with a chance to have a say in the development of the schoolyard, a questionnaire was delivered door to door throughout Brooklyn's. This map of the schoolyard outlines some of the concerns and ideas which were received from the questionnaire as well as from the various meetings which had been held. The red stars on the map outline two major problems which were identified by some residents. The first problem had to do with the fact that two hydro poles were located on the west side of Krawcheck School, right in the middle of the schoolyard. Because there was general agreement that these poles presented a potential hazard in the yard, the NIP resident committee was able to use NIP funds to have them removed and to provide an underground power service for the school. The second major problem was more controversial. It had to do with the traffic on Pacific Avenue and the fact that students in Butterworth School had to cross the street to get to and from the schoolyard. Concerns expressed here related to the nature of the traffic on Pacific Avenue. Because Pacific was a very wide street, it tended to be used illegally as both a truck route as well as a drag strip. With these various concerns in hand, the NIP Resident Committee approached the University of Manitoba's Department of Landscape Architecture for assistance. Victor Callis, a second-year master's student, agreed to adopt the schoolyard project as his thesis topic. Victor took the various ideas that had been put forth to date and incorporated them into an initial concept plan for the schoolyard. One of the key elements of the plan called for the closure of Pacific Avenue between the two schools. The plan was presented at a public meeting at Krawcheck School in April 1979. For those residents who were unable to attend, an attempt was made to bring the public meeting to them through the production of a special television program on cable TV. Because it was seen as a major issue, the proposed closure of Pacific Avenue was emphasized. Following the program, Brooklyn's residents were encouraged to phone the NIP office, where members of the resident committee were on hand to record their comments, which turned out to be very supportive. Over the following months, Victor continued with his research, taking note of how teachers made use of the schoolyard, observing the children at play, meeting with them in the classroom, consulting with school staff, and presenting alternative plans and ideas at public meetings in the neighborhood. In December 1979, Victor presented his final report to the NIP Resident Committee. In this report, Victor presented two alternative concept plans, which he had drawn up for the schoolyard. The plans differed in that one allowed for Pacific Avenue to remain open, while the other called for the closure of Pacific Avenue and the integration of the street space into the final schoolyard development. Because he felt that it would provide a superior community facility, Victor recommended that the committee approve this plan in principle and that they seek a temporary four-month closure of Pacific Avenue to determine its effects on traffic. The resident committee adopted Victor's recommendation and earmarked $700,000 of NIP funds for the schoolyard development. It also sought and received approval in principle for this master conceptual plan from both the St. James Assiniboia School Division as well as the City of Winnipeg. At this time, extensive negotiations took place between the school board and the city to work out an ongoing joint use agreement. The NIP Resident Committee then formally approached the St. James Assiniboia Community Committee to apply to have the street closed on a trial basis. A group of residents in opposition to the idea of closing the street 
petitioned the community committee. The NIP resident committee then agreed to have a meeting with the petitioners. That meeting was held here at Krawczyk School. Realizing that the closure of the street was only for a trial period, the majority of the petitioners who attended the meeting formally endorsed the planned approach. The resident committee arranged to have the laneway on the west side of Butterworth School extended from Pacific Avenue right across the school board's property to Ross Avenue to the south. It was hoped that once this lane was in place, the disruption of internal neighborhood traffic caused by the closure of Pacific Avenue would be kept to a minimum. Once the city of Winnipeg had taken traffic counts on all the streets in the area, the resident committee held the community work festival through which Brooklyn's residents were invited to come out and to help to transform the street into a park space. During this work festival, the residents themselves were the ones to set up the temporary barricades. Planters and park benches, which were available at no cost from the city's storage yard, were erected and revitalized. During this trial closure period, many residents, particularly the school children, had a chance to enjoy the recreational opportunities provided by the street space. Further traffic counts were conducted on Pacific Avenue and the adjacent streets to determine how this closure had in fact affected traffic in the neighborhood. In the meantime, the resident committee selected the firm of Hilderman Fair Witte and Associates to review these traffic counts and to coordinate the detailed planning and design tasks for the project. Dave Witte, a senior partner in the firm, served as project manager. Received by the school board. A study of this type that takes a great deal of time and a great deal of effort and involves a wide variety of people, citizens from the area, committees, the politicians in the city as a whole, as well as various government departments. It requires a, a structure, a structure that allows people to understand how they will participate, how decisions will be made, and where the, where the study is headed. It's not a hard structure that causes people to feel uncomfortable, but really one that's flexible, sets out targets and dates, and indicates when we're going to do certain things. Brooklyn's involved a large process, one with quite a few people with many interests. And so we developed a process chart, set out target dates and various targets or uh, meeting times when we thought that we should get together and review material. We also included within that uh, process some of the major types of information that we would need in order to make good decisions, decisions that people would be comfortable with. On this particular process, you'll see various yellow coated points. These are points where we felt at the start of the study, we would have to have community participation. As the study progressed, in fact, we had more points of community participation. But at the very beginning, before we actually undertook the work, we were able to set out what we thought was going to be the necessary process, one that would involve all of us, including ourselves as consultants. By doing this, at the very start, the committees, the citizens, and others who were involved understood what would be expected of them, the roles and responsibilities. The key point to remember